joined us. Welcome to the call today. Maybe you can start by introducing yourself and tell us who you are. My uh, name's Angus, Angus Brown. Um, I'm the co-CEO of a company called Sempi. Uh, we're a, a Bitcoin, Bitcoin is free wallet, uh, and we've been around in the space for a couple of years. Uh, we're based here in South Africa, um, global footprint customers from, I think we're on about 76 countries around the world at the moment. And, uh, still excited about the whole cryptocurrency Bitcoin vision. Uh, despite all the ups and downs and the noise and everything. But maybe I should start by going back a little bit uh, about me. Um, my background uh, is in banking. I started off in banking a good uh, 20 years ago or so in, what was it, 98. Um, started off with a company here in South Africa called Rand Merchant Bank, um, which actually at the time bought another company called First National Bank, and they became quite well known. Uh, FNB is, is now a player across the African continent and possibly the biggest bank in, in South Africa. And I was very lucky to be part of that team when they were still you know, growing and doing many things and, and uh, building businesses. Um, and I think in some ways, my journey goes in circles. I think everyone's journey, you go through things and when you reflect back on it, you go, wow, that was a starting point for something I'm doing now. Uh, and that perhaps was in 2000 when, when I was at First National Bank. Uh, we launched a business called ebucks.com. And ebucks.com was the group's e-commerce initiative. And this was in the, in the 2000s, just after Y2K when everyone is excited about .com and you must build a .com business. We built uh, an ebucks.com, which was actually uh, the world's first, as far as we know, bank-backed digital money. And we built it as an initiative to enable certain parts of the group to do certain things. But it was a, a very successful business. It's gone on to be uh, the top financial services loyalty program in South Africa year after year since inception. We built the ebuck originally as the currency of the loyalty program and as a, mean, a means for people to be able to make payments online because we realized that credit cards don't work very well, weren't widely distributed across the South African's population. And there's, you know, it's an old mechanism. It's from the 70s. So we built a new mechanism, which was a digital currency called the e-book. And it's funny how you look at that. That was in 2000. And we we're grappling with problems like, how do you price it? Does it stay the same rand to the dollar? Do you make it stable or do you let it float free? Um, who looks after the database? Uh, do we bring other participants and make it an open ecosystem or do we have a closed ecosystem just for, for, the, for the people in there? And we went through hacks and hacking attempts and we processed lots of transactions and we had to deal with how do we get transactions per second through. And it's just interesting to look back on those things that we were building and doing in, in back in 2000 and how that maybe informs some of my journey more recently. So um, I was in that, that business. I took over as CEO of that business in 2003, uh, created profitability in the business, which was great, um, and then did many other things in first round. Um, call center, quite a lot of banking uh, initiatives, creating new banking environments, new internet banking arrangements. I moved on from First National to other banks. Uh, I've worked for two large listed banks uh, in my time and a couple of other large listed companies setting up payments ventures. So very much in the payment space, um, I think of myself as a payments banker, somebody who's saying, how do we make payments and money movement better for ordinary people? Um, no, you know, there's lots of other things that banking does, lending and uh, all sorts of other things. But to me, that was the most important thing. And I've been focusing on that for, for many years. In the last five years, I've been on my own, building my own businesses. So I had a nice journey with uh, the team down at Better. We were launching um, a neobank. I've uh, been involved with Integrate Me, which is a digital, um, digital identity service provider. So where people can take sovereign ownership of their own identity and look after their identity and not leave other people to manage their, their digital identity. But in uh, 2016, I met uh, my co-founder, Lorian, and we built this business called Send uh, He's a blockchain guy. And uh, so he came to me and said, hey, there's this amazing thing called Bitcoin. It just works. Explain to me how it works. It's like, yeah, that, that's what payments are supposed to be. That's how they're supposed to work. 
and said, let's build a business on that. And that's how we formed ZB in late 2016. Um, we launched to public in 2017. Um, and we've been doing, you know, pretty much that with uh, additions and alterations and enhancements since then. All right. Great. I mean, uh, that's that's quite a lot of experience, you know, in banking as well, in terms of uh, the payments, like you call yourself uh, a payments banker. Would you say it was, uh, you know, how it works and the idea behind it was very much informed by your previous experience in banking? Or in payment? Uh, it was. And I mean, I've been, as I said, in the payment space for a long time. And that is uh, what they call business to consumer, B2C, is serving ordinary people and providing a service directly to them. Not writing software that other people are buying from you. Um, and not, not in that space, but very much create websites or apps or, or systems for people that can actually use your services. Um, I was you know, very closely involved with eBucks when we launched the first mobile banking initiative where you could actually bank on your phone. Um, old technologies way back then on Nokia phones with systems called WIG and WAP and USSD, which is still around. Um, we launched that. And so I said, like, people need to be able to use their mobile devices to be able to transact, not just fancy laptops or desktops uh, with, you know, decent connections, but people who had to plug a SIM card in and had to worry about how much data they used and, and how they actually, you know, were able to get messages up and down quickly and easily and cheaply. So that was mobile banking that we built back in, I think it was 2005, uh, we launched that. And that also informed how we launched Centpi. I mean, we launched Centpi as a mobile only offering. So you can't go to centpi.com, the website and transact with us. You download the app, on your Android or your, your Apple phone. Uh, and we're primarily Android. It's the, the vast majority of what people use. And we built it as a mobile app. So Centby effectively is informed by all those things we learned doing um, mobile banking. And uh, mobile banking was, was big. I mean, it still is more than half of the bank's uh, internet transactions actually run off the mobile phone, not off the, the laptop and cell phone. So we built in 2016 mobile only which also means your interfaces have to be designed like that. Uh, I spend a lot of time on what they call user experience or the interface. So when somebody opens your app, what do they see? What are they thinking about? How easy is it to press the next button? And how simple is it to when they capture information, it seems obvious that they should be putting that information in and it's appropriate for what gets done not just design things that are looking amazing from a graphics point of view. Lots of people can make pretty pictures, but making these things work for users is about making sure that they are simple, easy, intuitive, and, and the sort of the steps just drop naturally from one to the other. So that's using my payments experience and how we built uh, the CNP the app. Still not perfect. Uh, there is no such thing as a user experience, that a user design that is perfect. There's only one that you're making better every day from the last version. You release a new update, you put it out there. So there's a lot of my payments experience that has come through there. There's also experience, I think, that's come through in the regulatory side. Um, I was obviously head of the internet banking business for a bank, processed a couple of billion rands worth of transactions per month over the platform. It was the bank's primary transactional platform, did much more than checks and any other instruments. So it was the most important channel in that way for the bank. So we had a, a very significant responsibility to look after security, user security, the bank's security, deter hackers, et cetera. And we apply the same thinking in Centby. How do we make sure we don't get hacked? How do we make sure that our systems are sound and solid and people are protected and they're, they're, you know, everything's done there? And also with the, the regulators, how do you have a good relationship? From being in the banking side for 20 years, I've built up good relationships with all the regulators, um, had myself approved by the regulators as you know, a payments executive. Uh, I was chief information officer for a bank and chief of payments for, uh, for a bank. So you've got to understand what the regulators want, what they need, why do they want what they, what they need, um, and how do you work with them? And that's also applied to how we do things as CNB, is very much working with the regulators, being close to the regulators, helping them to understand crypto. You know, it sounds crazy. It's like crypto. It, it means like dark things, doesn't it? 
And you explain to them that, well, the internet has been using cryptography for the past 20 years. It's whenever you see that little lock icon that closes in the top corner, that's cryptography. We've been using that in banking for the last 20 years to keep our banking system safe. So just starting to explain that, you know, you don't have to be scared of all of these things. They have a, a reason and a purpose. So yeah, a lot of my experience with regulators uh, folds into what we do now um, with, uh, with Centby um, and the services that we offer. We try to make sure that the regulators understand what we're doing and we're close to the regulators and advising them. I, I think we are quite familiar uh, with the fact that Centby is uh, it, it, uh, really works closely with uh, the regulators. You know, uh, the fact that, you know, you got into the sandbox as well. I think it's also proof of that, that you really do want to work with regulators. Uh, and, you know, we'll probably touch on that uh, later on. But maybe at this point, I would like you to talk to us about, you know, uh, last year, you obviously raised quite a huge sum of money. Uh, which was quite impressive. Maybe you can talk to us about that. Sure. So, I mean, we started this business, Lorian and I, um, out of what they call bootstrapping. So we used to earn money to get the, the business off the ground and started. Um, so that was you know, literally sort of borrow money from our bonds and you know any savings that we have to get things going. Don't pay ourselves for I think the first year. We didn't draw any money out of the business. Um, and that is to get the business up and running and started like all entrepreneurs. You don't just wait until you get money. You get going. You build something. Uh, you make sure that you use your savings. You get things going. And then once you've built something that's reasonable, we had like a prototype and actually working full prototype built. You know, Lorian had integrated to the nodes into the Bitcoin uh, backend and everything. Then we went and we raised some money. Um, we raised uh, our first funds in 2017, if I remember correctly, it was our first uh, what they call a seed fundraising. It's where you get enough money that somebody says, okay, so you, know, you can improve your infrastructure, you can get bigger, prove to me that what you've got is scalable and can grow and you, know, you can finish your product. That was our first seed funding, which we raised um, out, of, uh, out of UK. We raised um, a second funding round, which was that larger funding round in 20, I remember, 2018, 2019, uh, which was quite a significant fundraising round. Um, some from the few previous investor, you know, always if you're raising money from people, go back to the people who backed you in the first place and say, are you prepared to put more money in? Look how we've been growing the business. Do you trust us? Um, so some from there, but also some from some new investors who came in as well um, from Holland and Antigua. So that gave us a little bit more money. And that was enough for us to grow the team. So the team is now sitting on eight people here in Johannesburg. Also gave us money for marketing. So we're able to expand and actually market the offering properly to customers. So we're sitting on about 50,000 uh, customers in the CMP wallet. And we're sitting on you know, quite a few more customers in the Minute Money Remittance app as well. So we're able to grow, get to customers, get your marketing right, make sure that your uh, IT is solid. Um, we use uh, the cloud. So we back, you know, store everything out of the cloud and be able to draw a bit of a salary. So it also does help when we can pay our team members and we can also draw a little bit of a salary for ourselves. Um, and that's what you, know, you raise your money for, to grow your business, to prove your model, and then to be able to start scaling. So you can go to your investors and say, hey guys, my cost of acquiring a customer is this, and it's reducing. So I know that if you give me more money, I'm gonna be able to acquire more customers, and this is the financial path that you'll be on. Because a lot of the time your investors are going, okay, that's great, we see what you're doing, but now where's that money gonna go? If we give you more money, is it just gonna to go to salaries and Lambos, or is it actually gonna to go to growing customers, growing revenue, showing us that this business is going to be a profitable business in the future? All right, great. I mean, uh, in total, how much have, has sent to be raised so far? There's some, one raise we did disclose was a million pounds. That's that last raise. Uh, we have raised a small amount since then. We've had another raise which happened last year. Um, we haven't disclosed how much that is. Um, I was going to say it's, it's not a large amount of money. It was what I call a bridge round. It's just to tide us over during this COVID craziness um, so that actually we don't have to go back to the market too often because you want to have enough money in the business that you're not spending your days knocking on people's doors saying, hey, I need to raise more money. 
You want to have some money in the bank that gives you comfort, you can pay salaries, you can grow the business, and you can grow revenues. The ideal position, of course, is that you're getting enough money from income, from your revenues, from your customers, that you don't need to raise money. That's a self-funding business, like a, a good healthy business should be. Then you can choose, do you want to raise more money from debt or from equity, and then use that to grow your business on a very fast trajectory? Um, and so most businesses take a few years to get to the point that they can actually have enough income coming in to cover their costs. Um, so I don't want to disclose how much we took now, but it was a modest amount. And then we took a seed funding round uh, before that, which was, let's call it a couple of million rand, a fairly small fundraising in the beginning. I know that Cent B has a good relationship with Bitcoin SV. Um, and I believe that you've also built you know, I, uh, the business uh, on Bitcoin SV. Maybe you can tell us what was the motivation behind building on Bitcoin SV. Sure, and uh, it sounds controversial now, but um, in its day, it was completely logical. I think uh, you can see from my background is um, coming from the payment space. If, if you're dealing with something in payments, it's got to meet a couple of attributes. It's got to be scalable. It's got to be cheap. It's got to be fast. It's got to be reliable. It's got to be sound. It's not got to be something that changes all the time. Those are some of the things that any technology in the payment space is built on, whether you're talking QR codes, credit cards, card machines, any, any particular payments thing has to meet those attributes. If it meets those attributes, you can use it as a technology. When we built um, Bitcoin, when we built CNB originally, it was built on Bitcoin, which at the time was BTC. But uh, that, that was what we built on. And we... We looked, should we build on Ethereum or Litecoin or some of these other coins? And we, Lorian's view, which I back, is just that uh, there's one which is the original and it's simple and everybody knows it and it's got thousands of nodes and it works. So it's like, use that. So that was our original launch was on Bitcoin BTC. Then there was the separation between cash, Bitcoin cash and Bitcoin BTC, um, which really revolved around the block size and the fee. So if you look at the, the history of that, what was called the hash war at the time, was really just about, well, can, can you make a payment for less than a dollar? And the way BTC was built is that the price, the fees started going up. We're a payments business. You need to be able to make a $10 payment. You're going to make a $10 payment. You can't have a fee of a dollar. And the fees were going up to dollar, $2, et cetera. So it was like, okay, well, there is a problem here. We have to be able to make... Uh, transactions and they also need to be scalable. Scalable in my books is thousands of transactions per second, not hundreds of transactions per day. So thousands of transactions per second is what you need to get adoption. If you want to be a payment system, you have to be working at those sort of volumes. And you also have to be legally sound. It's one of the key elements of any payment system is that the, the instruments you use must be 100% certain there cannot be any ability to go and change something after the fact. So when you play a transaction, it needs to be bedded down that that transaction is played and confirmed instantly. And that is also legally in, you know, viable that you can go to court, take with a transaction record and say to a judge with an expert, this is actually the transaction with the signatures and the digital signatures applied. So those are some of the problems that were emerging, unfortunately, um, with the, the whole SegWit BTC change. So we went down the Bitcoin Cash route because it's scalable and fast and, and simple. So it sounds controversial because it sounds ideological. It's not ideological. It's pure technically practicality. What is essential in order to make a payment system operate, that hundreds of people are processing transactions around the world all the time, and those transactions are cheap. Cheap is essential. You can't have a payment system with transactions that are anything more than a cent into a penny. Then there was a second round of that particular hash war, which you're probably aware of, which is the split between Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin SV. Um, that perhaps was a little more ideological. Um, if I look back at the conversations happening over there, um, but we basically said Bitcoin Cash, as, as a cash is essential. It's what Satoshi wrote in the white paper. Um, and we just happened to say, well, the SV version is the one that is more regulatory friendly and is going to original protocols to be a very stable protocol. Because again, if somebody's building something on the internet, 
you need to rely on that protocol as being stable all the time. That you can't go that you know developers are moving things around and changing features. Um, imagine if like we couldn't watch uh, YouTube because somebody had changed IP version, you know, version six to IP version seven, and another set of developers were going, oh no, we're calling it version seven B, and having a fight about it. It's like you need your IP to be stable to be able to run the businesses on top. It's very much we look at um, cryptocurrency as an enabler of businesses. It's not the business itself. Uh, you know, I really think that what Bitcoin does give us is the ability to pay for things, but not the thing that is so exciting. It's the ability to pay for things and therefore all the businesses that can be built on top of using Bitcoin as the payment mechanism. Reading the original white paper, that's very much what was said there is that this is a mechanism to be able to get payments done quickly and easily, fast, cheap across many different people in ways that is sound and reliable. Now, all of this now sounds controversial because I know there's different camps and people believe different things. And I just look at it and say, yeah, it's unfortunate that people have different views and they worry about that. Look at it, we're just plugging away at our business and go, we're just here to make payments simple and easy. And that's why we happen to use Bitcoin SV. We think it, it meets those criteria. Has Bitcoin SV lived up to the ideals that you initially, you know, uh, intended it to be in terms of uh, working for Cent B? Has it worked uh, well for Cent B so far? I'd say in a mixed way, the general answer is yes. Technically, it is absolutely sound. I mean, uh, I saw Steve Shadows doing a demonstration, uh, a live demonstrations of thousands of transactions per second. This isn't some test net in a lab. Um, the system absolutely scales. I mean, we are running you know, hundreds of transactions a day on the system and it's absolutely fine. Um, we're not at all plagued with stability or problems or anything like that. It's doing what the network says it's supposed to do reliably. I know legally it's sound um, and also because it stays away from coin mixes and all sorts of privacy enhancing technologies. Um, that those, because regulators, you say privacy enhancing to a regulator, they hear you've got something to hide. Um, so you've got to stay away from that. And if it stays away from that and, you know, it's pseudonymous, everything's on the, on the blockchain, you can see what's going on. That is regulatory friendly. And if you want to have a payment system, a value system, it has to be regulatory friendly. Otherwise, you, you're living in a world where, you know, the regulators have no power, which unfortunately means that, you know, you can't rely on the systems of society. Society needs certain systems to operate. So it's important that, that it's regulatory sound and it's cheap. If I look at the prices from when, you know, the transaction fees are still a cent, fraction of a cent, every now and again, they reach up to a cent, a South African cent, which is absolutely fine. Um, so even down to being able to do microtransactions, it works fine. So technically, absolutely fine. The community has been growing, the community has been engaging and welcoming. So there's lots of developers writing codes and applications on top of Bitcoin, which I think is a good thing. You don't need people to be writing into Bitcoin. You need to be writing on top of Bitcoin. Maybe have a node implementation. Every year you release a new version of the node that's better and somebody else finds bugs and fixes the node, etc. Maybe implement a token that can go with it. So that's fine. But it's the businesses that are on top. It's being able to make a health transaction with your doctor, share your information with the doctor, uh, move a load of fish from one place to another and trace their provenance on the blockchain, be able to send money to a family member uh, and to use Bitcoin effectively for that. That's the important part. You know, there's the narrative Bitcoin. Everyone knows Bitcoin BTC. So most people have a Bitcoin BTC wallet. You speak to people about Bitcoin, they go, oh, BTC. So I personally would wish that more people would be aware of Bitcoin SV, um, not from a price perspective. Frankly, I don't care about what the price is doing. It's about do people know about it, use it, have a wallet and find that they can send money to somebody and buy something with their Bitcoin. So that part hasn't come as long as, as much as I'd want it to have been. But sometimes these things are slow. Sometimes you need to be patient. I mean, Satoshi released this code, what, in 2009? And it takes years before more than 20 people even had a node and were using it. And then 100 people. These curves are slow. But sometimes you just have to wait for those curves because you don't notice the inflection point. 
You know, I think unfortunately, any metaphor around viruses nowadays is, is, is sad because of the, the COVID virus and that. But you look at how those things curve and when you, you don't notice it and then suddenly there's adoption, there's lots. So we're just waiting for that curve to change. All right, great. Uh, yeah, thank you for that breakdown on Bitcoin SV. Obviously not many people are quite familiar, you know, with DeFi and what's happening around today. Some of these technologies may sort of seem to have been shelved a bit. Uh, but like you said, Satoshi's vision uh, still lives on. You talk about Bitcoin SV being, you know, the right platform when it comes to regulation. Uh, and from a regulatory standpoint, maybe would, 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 do you mind, you know, touching on that, especially around South Africa? We've seen quite a lot happening the, the the you know the 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 regulators recently launched the position paper on crypto and there's really quite a lot of activity and buzz around crypto regulation in South Africa maybe you mind touching on that and just giving us an, an idea of what South Africa looks like right now in terms of regulation yeah i think i've i've learned more about crypto and payments legislation than any person should have to know about in their life and I still would not consider myself um, an expert on it. Regulation is complex. So I can understand why people are, are nervous of trying to understand what's going on. Um, and I think also a lot of the crypto community didn't get into crypto because they thought regulation was a good idea, to be frank. You know, Bitcoin gives you the ability to control your own money, to look after money, to be able to be independent of central control points. Some of the original features of Bitcoin. That doesn't necessarily mean that regulation is bad and that we want society to have no regulations at all. We like the fact that when there's a fire, you can phone the fire brigade and somebody in authority can come and help with your neighbors to put out the fire. And we like the fact that order is around and that gives us safety that, you know, our, you know, our mothers and children can walk to school and, you know, feel safe. Those are important things that, you know, society provides around us. So I think people sometimes get very excited about, you know, the we must be independent and there's like weighed up against what also is necessary. And you look at what are regulators trying to do? Um, they are in some ways trying to control things. Let's be frank, there is a level of control, but often you sort of go, why are they trying to control something? They are genuinely looking for the best possible outcome for society in general. So society in general, money laundering, let's talk about that. We do not want a society where money launderers can get away with laundering money. Because if they do, it just encourages crime. It lowers the barrier for crime so people can do crime and launder the money and get away with it. Because if you, whatever crime you do, you need to launder the money in order to be able to use the money. No point in doing crime without a financial crime without the money. So if we allow money laundering, we're effectively enabling crime. And with none of us want to live in a world where, where that is the case. So we want to fight money laundering. So we want to be able to stop that. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that all of the actions that banks put in place and every point they put into place is the right thing or is effective or doing the right way. But they are trying for the right objectives so that they can detect. Um, and so what we do is that means you've got to gather a bit of information about your customers, like who are you? You know, you can't be completely anonymous because if everyone's completely anonymous, well, you're just enabling money laundering. And unfortunately, you only need to enable a small amount of money laundering for ta to taint the whole system. So that's why we do think that some of the regulations like anti-money laundering, KYC, know your customer, which every institution should do. But that also means you don't have to be over the top. You don't have to look at the pay slip for everybody, maybe for the higher balances or the higher amounts of money. So based on how much risk is in the system, so you must have a control for that. So that's what one of the regulators is trying to do, is trying to address money laundering concerns, which is fine. Um, there are other concerns around um, exchange control. Many countries in Africa have forms of exchange control. So you might have made some money in Kenya or in Uganda or in South Africa, and now you want to move some of that money to another country. You want to buy property in England or something. Uh, or if you're really wealthy, buy a club, one of the English football clubs. But yes, do you, should there be some controls over that? 
And unfortunately, in some countries, there are controls. And maybe they were for the right reason to stop people stealing large quantities of the country's money and disappearing to another country and taking the proceeds of crime with them. So there are these controls in place. So there are some regulatory controls that says, if you want to move above a certain amount of money overseas, you must ask for permission. Why must you do that? So that they can know where does that money come from? Is there actually a good source behind your money? Were you a good business person and managed to like make good money from business or does that money come from somewhere that's a bit strange? Those are good questions to ask for a regulator. The other thing a regulator needs to know is what's called the balance of payments. How much money do we have in a country? How much money is going out, paying for things like oil imports, et cetera? How much money is coming in from remittances and gifts and aid and for the products that we make as a country, for the flowers that we sell, et cetera? So you need to know what's that balance. The balance of that, the balance of payments, the central bank is accountable for keeping track. So a lot of what regulators really want is simply, please let us know how much money is going in and how much money is coming out. And they measure that at the banks. Every bank keeps a track of how many dollars are coming in, how many dollars are being are going out. They report that the central bank builds up its accounts. And that will allow it to decide, can we borrow money internationally? Do we need to change the inflation rate? Do we need to change the exchange rate if we manage it? These are things that an a central bank does to manage its it's money, effectively, it's money as a country. And so Bitcoin isn't on that list. So what regulator says, please let's add Bitcoin to that list so we can just see what amount of money in Bitcoin is going in and out. So it might seem invasive for a regulator to say, I want to know how much Bitcoin you've bought. It's because they really just want to know, has that money actually left the country? Is it going to come back? Where are we going to account for it? Has it come from a good source? Has it like been you know, properly earned, et cetera, in that sort of space? Um, and how do we manage that? It's effectively saying Bitcoin is money. Isn't a regulator saying, I want to regulate it, saying to all of us that they've actually accepted that Bitcoin is money. Now they're just bringing it into the system so they know how to measure it. Then there's tax. Uh, I mean, none of us love paying tax, but we like having the benefits of tax. We like to know that you know, if a poor relative needs to go to hospital, that you know, the state will pay for the medical or the facility if no one else is able to pay, for the roads that we travel on, for the ports and all that sort of infrastructure which is stay together. That gets paid for by tax, um, which also means that if you make profits, you should be paying your taxes on it. So if people are trying to hide from tax by using Bitcoin to hide away from tax, well, it's like hiding from tax in any other way. And unfortunately, the tax regulators are smarter. They're slower, but they're smart. They figure out where you're hiding your tax. So some people, I think, have tried to use Bitcoin to dodge tax. And I don't think that's very ethically a good thing to do or a very successful strategy because guess what? The Bitcoin ledger sits there forever. So I can still look at transactions that happened three years ago. Uh, and in three years time, I can still look at transactions. So, um, you know, maybe the, the ledger isn't the best way to hide tax. But what is a regulator trying to do? He's trying to make sure that he's getting his fair amount of tax into the system so that he can spend the money on teachers' salaries and things like that. So those are examples of what regulators are trying to do. Another important one is scams. Unfortunately, a lot of people are suffering from poverty. And when you're suffering from poverty, you're open to scams. People will come to you and say, hey, if you give me your, your money, I'll give you 10% back at the end of the month, promise. And the more outrageous the promise, unfortunately, the more attractive it is. And so people are able to make scams and steal money. This is old. This predates Bitcoin. Uh, this has been going back you know, 50 years or so. But people have now used Bitcoin as a scam. So give me your money, I'll put it into Bitcoin, I'll mine my Bitcoin for you and I'll make money for you. It's just a scam. A lot of these, unfortunately, um, maybe even some of them started off right, but uh, they're not good. And what is a regulator there? The regulator is there to protect people against those sort of scams. And that's exactly right. You want a regulator to be warning people, hey, this particular type of business is dubious. And when they find businesses that are doing this to be able to arrest the people and seize whatever money they can and to be able to return that money back to the investors who had lost money in that. So this sort of consumer protection, protecting people against scams and, and that sort of stuff, 
is exactly what I think every person who's a businessman and every person who's a citizen and has family members would say, you support that. So these are the general thrust of the legislations coming into South Africa. Um, uh, Anti-money laundering legislation, making sure the taxes are paid, exchange control, measuring the flows, uh, preventing scams, making sure that people who give you advice are qualified to give you advice and that you know they don't make all sorts of lies and, and, and promises out there and that they look after your money. If they take your money or your Bitcoin, have they run off with it to Dubai or somewhere or is it still actually managed properly and protected against hacks by people who are technically competent and morally sound? So these are the things things that are coming in place. Um, they don't all happen at the same time. It's not like the regulator can write one piece of law and it's all magically done. So expect regulation to be slow, uh, fragmented, and at a different pace in each jurisdiction. So in South Africa, they've now put out a roadmap as to where the regulation is coming in. Uh, and we're quite aware of that roadmap. We've been helping, we've been preparing for it. I mean, we've got all our documents and everything ready for all of that. And some of the things we've already self-regulating and self-reporting some, some things. But we'll notice in a country next door, uh, pick one like Zimbabwe, uh, it's maybe they haven't got there yet. They're still sort of at the point of, we're not quite sure, there's been a few people who've been ripped off by Bitcoin, so we're gonna caution people against you so they don't have a roadmap. And then you get some countries, uh, an example, maybe Nigeria, which recently sort of went backwards a little bit, said, we think Bitcoin is dangerous and we're going to you know, say, advise people not to, to have Bitcoin, etc. So you're seeing in different countries, different approaches. But that's also, unfortunately, regulators run in their own little countries and blocks across Africa and across the world. So you have to actually let each guy run at his own pace uh, across that. And I always look at it, here is businesses that are licensed and properly regulated and a very crypto-friendly world. Here is a business, you know, They've got no idea. Regulations don't say anything about how would you like it to go? We're all sort of modern people. We're like a simple straight line up to there. The real world is that goes like that to get there. And that sometimes means it goes backwards. So I believe sometimes a country will ban something or give a warning or something like that. It just means that they haven't yet got to the next step and they're taking their own path to what I think where everybody will be which is that businesses will have licenses, they'll be regulated, um, they will be run by proper sound people who are able to serve large numbers of customers reliably and soundly, and the regulators can see everything that's going on. It's just, we have to be patient, um, and you also got to act ethically as well. Even if there is no regulation in your country, does that mean you can do what you like? That's not, uh, I think, a good way to start a business. Because if you're in business, you should be in business for 10 or 15 years out. You look at at 10 or 15 years time, what sort of customers will I have? What will my relationship with be with my regulators in multiple jurisdictions? Because I won't just be in South Africa. I'll be in Kenya, I'll be in Uganda, I'll be in Nigeria, I'll be in Singapore, I'll be in the UK. And they're going to look back on my track record of behavior and they're going to say, have you been behaving to the best possible standards, looking after your customers, making sure you're giving people legal certainty, looking after your systems, your technology? Have you been educating people? Have you been communicating with the press, uh, putting out messages so that customers can know how to distinguish between a scam and between something good? Have you been educating the regulators? Have you been sitting down with somebody and not just telling them your point of view, but listening to their concern as well? The regulator says, I'm worried about this particular type of risk. And you go, I understand. Go back and think about it. Come up with a suggestion. Help them. You've touched quite on uh, quite a number of things around regulation. And I think a, a lot of us really see South Africa as having already set the pace when it comes to regulation on the African continent. And it's really nice to get that breakdown from, you know, from you, as, as especially from the fact that you've also been dealing with regulators. And so at this point, maybe I would like you to talk about, you know, the sandbox. Uh, you know, uh, you already uh, have a product already uh, in the regulatory sandbox. Uh, you're interacting with the regulators uh, regularly. Maybe you can talk to us about how that 
relationship came about why you decided to get sandboxed and you know the experience that you've gained and possibly also lessons for others across the continent who are looking at possibly how do i build a regulated product that fits with the you know uh, the regulators you know direction or way of doing things sure no, and we we're certainly very pleased uh, as saint to be in the the sandbox with the ifwg um, which is the, the IFWG is the gathering of all the regulators, the financial regulators in South Africa. They put together a task team to say, how do we support fintech in the country? And one of those themes in fintech, fintech is crypto. So they're actually trying to support all of fintech, insure tech and reg tech and all those other words, not just crypto. So it's not just purely a crypto thing, but we're very pleased in, the, in this particular part um, to be contributing. Um, so the sandbox the sandbox is how a regulator sets up in- interactions with businesses that are testing out market ready solutions. So it's not just about an idea. You can't go into a sandbox and, hey, I've got a slide deck which talks about an idea. It must be what's called a market ready solution. You must have built a prototype and be able to take a prototype to customers and be able to test how it works. That's the first thing. It's, it's just a level more advanced than just an idea. The other thing that they look for is, is this pushing a regulatory gray area? If there's a clear law that says, if you're an insurance salesman, this is what you do and this is how you do it. And why go into a sandbox? There's no need to. It's like the law says, this is how you do it. This is the license you apply for. This is the conduct rules that you're supposed to apply. There's no need. The sandbox is necessary is when, like crypto, there are things that are gray. You can interpret the law this way, or you can interpret it this way, and there's no clarity yet. The regulator hasn't defined and says it's this way or that way. Or there's a gap in the law that something like crypto is not not covered by anything in the law. So it's like, well, it's a gray area. So that's the point of a sandbox is to find where those gray areas are and those businesses like ourselves are putting in a solution which is in the gray area. The purpose for a regulator is to observe how businesses solve these problems um, and to be able to then write regulations that will allow them to be able to regulate properly so that they're able to go, maybe this definition needs to be improved or add crypto to this definition so that we can bring crypto firms into our licenses and regulation to make sure that they can be observed and be part of the business financial community. So that's what, a, what it's for. It's for the regulator to understand better, to listen to what's going on, to observe it, to then write better regulations and to publish new regulations as they go along. It's also, regulators have got an idea of what regulation they need to do in their head. It's like, if we were to implement the regulation this way, what would be the impact on the firm? And to have a conversation with them and say, we'd like you to report this information to us. And then we go back to them and say, we can't for this important technical reason. And they go, ah, okay, I see it. Okay, well, then let's ask you, can you get this information for us? Yes, we can. Okay, cool. Then we'll change that regulation from this idea we had to a subtly different one, which is then practical for the industry to use. That's the whole purpose. So the part of CNP that's in the sandbox um, is the remittance business. We call it Minute Money. It's a specific remittance app. Um, And it helps people move money from South Africa to Ghana. Now, we also have channels running to Uganda and Nigeria, um, but the Ghana one is specifically in that. So there's a specific little box which says what size, what volumes, et cetera, are we going to test? And we're testing it out and giving feedback to the regulator. We have meetings every two weeks. We share our data sets with them. They come back and ask questions about the data, what's going on. Uh, We also have the ability to talk about policy issues, like how do you identify customers? Uh, If we want to get a license uh, in some point as a financial product provider, how do we get experience? They say you need to have five years experience at being a product provider. What does five years experience mean in the Bitcoin world? Must you have been operating a business or must have you been selling insurance? Why is selling insurance relevant to Bitcoin? So these are the things that we then able to have policy discussions with the regulators. Um, I'm obviously not going to speak on the regulator's behalf. I can only speak on my behalf. Um, But it gives us a good opportunity for that regular 
backwards and forwards, data, questions, ideas, etc. And I can see that they are listening intently to what we say. They're thinking about what we say. They are actively you know, thinking about what are the implications. Um, we are certainly raising things with them, concerns, issues, long-term issues. Um, and we're certainly getting a responsive audience over there. Uh, I'm certainly not saying that we shape what the regulator does or thinks. They are listening to other people in the sandbox. There are multiple participants in other sandboxes. And they are also getting their own guidance. They've got their own lawyers, their own people to decide. Um, but I'm optimistic that they will get lessons about how industry works from this. We are getting uh, lessons and in things about what's important to the regulator. We're building relationships with them. But we're also getting better insight to when the regulations are published, how will we comply? which means we can start building our processes to be ready now so that there's no regulatory shock as you get to, you know, your, this is the date the regulation kicks in. Because what you don't want is 1st of July, a new law kicks in. Suddenly you've got a whole flood of applicants, 200 people with documents and everything arriving. The regulator is suddenly swamped with too much work and now he can't give responses back in time and everybody's arguing. We've seen something like that at the FCA in the UK where the regulator wasn't prepared for a big volume of crypto applications and has now had to try and sort of manage that. So you want to be prepared so that you don't end up with swamps and issues like that. Is that maybe a bit of useful feedback? Um, I can't really talk too much about some of the specifics in the sandbox. Obviously there are confidentiality agreements uh, that govern some of the stuff, which allows us to speak openly with the regulator and also allows the regulator to speak openly um, to us as well. Great. I think uh, what you've provided is is really quite uh, um, a lot of good information. I think a lot of us, you know, struggle with understanding what does the regulator really want. And sometimes we always look at regulators from this negative point of view. But I, I feel from your point of view, uh, this is really an opportunity to also help uh, sort of help shape policy as well, uh, sort of collaborating with the regulator to sort of define how policy looks like. I believe that should be uh, the idea. They, they do have that. And I certainly have a lot of sympathy for the regulators. Um, you know, it's very easy to throw bricks at a, at a regulator um, or any sort of institution. It's much harder to actually be inside them and have to deal with the agendas um, trying to protect the public, trying to be legally correct. Because remember, a regulator can't do things that are not within his scope of legal responsibility, because otherwise he's just going to go and get taken to court and, and that won't look good. Um, with limited resources, you know, these are companies in a way as well with a small number of people, uh, not the best, you know, money to be able to pay for anything and resources to do anything. So they are also resource constrained with many priorities. You know, I look at crypto as being one of the things our regulators dealing with, but there's many, many other priorities our regulators struggling with. I mean, how do you make sure the economy is good? How do you manage inflation rates? How do you make sure that, you know, our bonds are, are repaid on time? Uh, how do you manage you know, the needs of the population that say, hey, we need vaccinations, we need money for the vaccine. So where are we going to get that money from? Hey, central bank, go and make money for us. Um, all of these things are actually big priorities. Um, and now they've got to fit crypto in on the side. I think just because we're involved in crypto, we think it's important and it is to us. But we must have, I think, a little bit of humility that crypto is not really the most important thing in the world. And many of the regulators and you know, many of our leaders out there are dealing with other issues um, and we give them a little bit of space and time, which also means they'll get it wrong as well, is that um, you know, I see some crypto, re some regulators you know, going backwards or banning things or not being supporting of things. I think it's the wrong approach, but you know, like I make mistakes, other people can make mistakes too, and we give them the space to be able to, you know, correct their mistakes and uh, get uh, get things fixed in time. I mean, I really like your objective outlook of uh, the regulators, and I think we all should have that kind of a mindset. And, you know, as we wind up, what advice would you give to other entrepreneurs 
you know, who are building uh, solutions, especially for the African continent. Uh, you know, uh, you, you obviously have a lot of experience both in traditional finance and now in crypto, um, being able to raise for a startup, being able to actually get sandboxed and deal with the regulators and successfully, you know, uh, build a product uh, that goes to the mass market. What advice would you give to, you know, other startups and entrepreneurs who are just getting started? Yeah, I think um, this is one place where Africa is a fantastic place to be. Um, there are lots of entrepreneurs. There's a very entrepreneurial spirit that, that runs in Africa. Um, and I think that is, is very useful. Um, so it's great to be an entrepreneur in Africa. It's also hard, but that is also part of the, you know, the journey of an entrepreneur. If it was easy, well, I guess it wouldn't have the, the, the excitement of that. Um, lessons out of that, uh, build something. Okay, don't talk to people about something, go and build something. Uh, if you're a techie, write code. If you're not a techie, find a techie and get him to write code or her to write code with you so that you can actually have an actual product, a simple, simple product. And frankly, there isn't a system that can't be built in a month or two of concentrated effort and energy. You don't need a year to build something. You can build a basic solution in a month and a half, two months, and that sort of stuff. It's going to be clunky. It's not going to work fantastically, but you can build something. Then get that something in front of people. Actually start getting a customer. And can fake out a lot of things. You can manually wire the process. You can have emails that go backwards and forwards. Um, manage the, the system, you know, what they call it, fake it until you make it uh, at the background to, to make it work. Get a customer, find out what the customer values in your system and, and then do it again and iterate and fix. Be prepared to change your system all the time. I mean, the code that you write, your first code base is guaranteed to be obsolete at the end of a year. Throw it away. There will be a completely new rewrite needed of what you need to do. The lessons uh, as a business are what you get from your customers. So talking to customers, uh, using the product, actually trying out that sort of stuff is, is most important. Don't concentrate on raising money. Don't concentrate on launching to the media. Uh, don't concentrate on your friends. Concentrate on what the product actually is with an actual customer and getting it live and getting it working. Thank you so much, Angus. Uh, I think you've closed our interview in a, in a, in a, in a beautiful fashion. Um, I think all of us as entrepreneurs, I think we really need to hear that over and over again. And uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to have talked with you and also to, to sort of have also talked to the entrepreneurs across the continent. So thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. That's a pleasure. And um, keep striving, keep going. Uh, don't worry about the setbacks. Um, they, they're all there. Um, it's all good. Thank you. Thank you.